Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. I'm Danny Berger in London. It's 9 a.m. in New York, 2 p.m. here in London. Here are the top stories we're following for you at this hour. Liz Trust wins. Trust clinches the Tory leadership to become the UK's next prime minister, promising to cut taxes. Pound is steady to slightly lower. Europe's energy catastrophe. EU leaders race to find solutions to the energy crunch. Rationing begins to look inevitable as Russia's Gazprom decides to keep a key gas pipeline shut indefinitely. And energy fallout. European stocks slump. Euro retreats to a two-decade low. And gas prices surge with no clear solution in sight for the crisis. Well, let's start with the story here in the UK with Liz Truss set to become the next prime minister after winning the Conservative Party leadership race. Let's get straight to 10 Downing Street where Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden is setting by. So, Lizzie, we heard from Liz Truss, a short five-minute speech. But how does this set up the next prime ministership for Truss? Well, in that speech, Danny, she was very praising of her friend, as she called him, Boris Johnson, full of admiration. She said that he was admired from Kiev to Carlisle. Uh, so perhaps this message was targeted at the Tory party membership who voted her to be the leader of the Conservative Party. She also mentioned her three priorities, low taxes, energy and the NHS. So again, appealing to the base. Uh, it was notably scant on detail, though, and that's what the millions of people people in Britain will be craving at this point, as well as the markets, because, of course, the UK faces double-digit inflation. It's only set to rise. Uh, a, a recession, the Bank of England is predicting, uh, two years of negative or zero growth. Uh, and the majority of households, of course, are facing fuel poverty because of the energy crisis. So it's a forbidding in tray, the likes of which we haven't seen since the early 1970s, when you had the oil shock and the miners' strike. Mm. But we are expecting to learn more in the coming days. Liz Truss Tress is said to have a package up her sleeve that will be of the scale of the COVID furlough programme. And, and Lizzie, you know, in the results, we saw she won 57.3 percent of the Conservative Party members vote. I mean, it's hard to argue that she's coming in with any sort of mandate. What does this mean in terms of her policies, of her backing headed until we get another election? I think there's no choice but to tackle the cost of living crisis head on. Uh, what it looks like that might involve is a freeze on energy bills, but there are ups and downs to that. Uh, she needs to control inflation. Of course, energy is driving it. Uh, but uh, it's, it, it, it's going to be extremely expensive. And the question is where that funding comes from. If it's borrowing, uh, lots of market commentators have warned about a crisis for gilts and sterling. Uh, but she has also indicated that she would want to have a longer term plan for energy as well. And this would be the short term. But really, we're just waiting for the detail on what it would be. It looks like her chancellor would be Kwasi Kwarteng and her mm. business secretary would be Jacob Rees-Mogg. But they will meet on Wednesday morning and hopefully after that we'll get more detail on how they'll solve this energy crisis. Yeah. Lizzie, and, and quickly here, you and I had talked last week about the new term emerging, trustonomics, love it or hate it, but we know what the likely makeup of her government will be, as you mentioned. So what does that mean, what we know about the type of policies, the type of economic policy theory that she's going to approach this next year with? Well, as we heard in the acceptance speech, it's this emphasis on low taxes. She said that she intends to govern as she campaigned as a conservative. Uh, many of her closest supporters, though, are wondering how all of this adds up when she wants to cut taxes, but also help with energy bills, but also increase spending on defence. Uh, many of her closest supporters are actually saying that she'll have to U-turn in the first uh, early days of her premiership, which would undermine her authority. Uh, but trustonomics is defined by low taxes, but also this uh, resistance to what she calls the blob, the economic orthodoxy that is the Treasury and the Bank of England. Throughout the campaign, she's blamed the BOE for the inflation crisis, and she said that she wants to review its mandate. Yesterday, though, she said that she was very strongly in favour of its independence. So markets will be watching very closely so that the institution's credibility on fighting inflation isn't under mind.
side, what's even All right, Lizzie, thank You're you welcome. very much. A long day for you there since even before the sun comes up. We appreciate it. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden there. Let's also get to the market reaction. Please say joining us now is Peter Chatwell, head of global macro strategies trading at Mizuho Securities. I mean, what a day for you to join us, Peter. Probably probably apt the U.S. market is closed because it's all about the U.K. It's all about Europe. Yes. But, but let's start with what Lizzie was saying in the U.K. There's this fear, perhaps, of whether Truss's policies will exacerbate or lessen some of the damage we've seen in these markets in expectations. Sterling, that's at a 2008 low. You have yields spiking. How much is this already priced in? How much is the worst priced in in the U.K.? I think what we've done is that the market has come in to price this as being... Uh, an increasingly um, likely outcome, but we're not pricing this actually becoming the most likely outcome, mm. you know, the most probable outcome of some sort of sterling crisis um, as a result of, of this next move from the democracy of the UK. What's the likelihood that that would happen, that we'd get this sterling crisis? Well, I see a very, quite a clear path of probabilities. Now that we've had uh, a government, uh, you know, the, the, the leader of the Conservatives essentially buying into the, into the role through delivering a fiscal policy which the economy can't really afford, then I see us on a path to further inflation damage. Really what the, what the, the package of energy capping would do, take away inflation in the near term, upside risk to inflation mm -hmm. in the near term, it would push it into the future. Right. So over that three-year horizon, which is what the Bank of England looks at, uh, I see that their forecasts are, are completely untenable. As far as I'm concerned, I can't see inflation going down anywhere near towards 2% over that horizon. Therefore, the weaker currency and much higher interest rate uh, is, is what I can see over that medium-term horizon. Yeah. And I can therefore see the position for the consumer being worse than it, than it is now over the medium-term horizon. And therefore, I look ahead to the next political cycle, the possibility that we've got deteriorated government finances and then have a Labour government coming in. Yeah. I'm thinking of two potential crises that this reminds me of. One, first and foremost, I am reminded of the ERM crisis, so 1992. Mm. And then I'm, th I'm thinking about what's the possibility of a, an IMF bailout like in 1976. Well, you think that's possible, an IMF ba bailout? For, I guess some of the IMF yeah. members sit in the BOE, so they're, they're close to each other, but uh, is, yeah, I, I'm is wondering this a real about, possibility, or is this worst case you're talking about, Peter? Well, um, if, if that sequence where we have uh, the Conservative government deteriorating the fiscal position and then being replaced by a Labour government, mm. that's when I think that we could have quite a significant deterioration of the fiscal position such that if things haven't materially changed in the economy, and, and I don't see the trade deficit, the current account um, deficit, actually improving over that horizon, right. um, then, then those are the sort of scenarios that I think the market will increasingly price in as a tail risk at the moment, but becoming more probable as time goes forward. I mean, it, it, it's certainly a, a, a grim future that you're painting. So if the market were to price that in as a base risk, where does sterling go? Is it, is it far below parity? I don't think one needs to look much, much further than, than parity for now because that's okay. really, you know, it's, it's not really heavily priced into the options market over a three to six month horizon. So probably one only needs to look at, at parity to, to get a good payoff. Um, one, I think, should think about guilt yields though, should be thinking about a five handle being on those, should wow. be thinking about the terminal rate for this uh, Bank of England hiking cycle as being around about 5%. My estimates are that the neutral rate for the UK has been rising um, over the last 18 months and is now somewhere around four. So for the Bank of England to really tackle inflation, they need to be getting rates over, you know, I think comfortably above that this, towards this five. This is a, a very big repricing that the market will need to do to get this yes. all in. And, and this sort of doom loop that you're describing of higher yields at a, yet a consistently weaker currency is something that Europe is facing as yes. well. Is, is there any level for Europe, for the UK, at which yields become high enough that they can attract foreign buyers yet again? Uh, well, that, I, I think, can only happen once the, the situation in the US has really peaked and that we've seen the market pricing in all of the dollar upside. And for me there, looking at the US, what I see on the interest rate curve there is that we're pricing in these cuts from March 2023 down to December 2025. And I don't see those as being deliverable. Mm. 
So if we're right, the inflation turns out to be a lot stickier, that the Fed has more to do over the uh, medium-term horizon and actually can't cut rates, has to pause or maybe even hike uh, after Q1 of next year, then there's more dollar upside as that interest rate path is priced in. So really, one could only expect that the euro, uh, sterling and other major crosses against the dollar could stabilise, you know, could be flawed, mm -hmm. probably uh, Q2 of next year onwards. So we've still got a lot of room for downside. And, and until that happens, and continuing to have a really strong dollar, I mean, it's punishing sterling, euro, yeah. the yen. It, it just globally, central banks are faced with this. Will we get to a point where we start to talk about foreign exchange cooperation? Oh, it's been difficult in the past. And I think <clears throat> given the, the new and you know the the geopolitical situation that we're in now and the likelihood that it remains this way as you know globalization continues to roll back then i don't think we have the capacity really to make those sort of accords okay peter i'm afraid that's all we have time for thanks so much for joining us some big bold ca calls and a, probably an injection of realism we all need peter chatwell there of mizuho now keeping you up to date with the first news from around the world here is angel feliciano angel Danny, thank you. Liz Truss has won the bitter race to succeed Boris Johnson as UK Prime Minister. The Foreign Secretary emerged victorious today after a two-month Conservative Party leadership contest that started with 11 candidates and concluded with a runoff against former Chancellor of the Exchequer Rishi Sunak. Truss made a short speech after the results were announced. And my friends, we need to show that we will deliver over the next two years. I will deliver a bold plan to cut taxes and grow our economy. I will deliver on the energy crisis, dealing with people's energy bills, but also dealing with the long-term issues we have on energy supply. Truss won't take power until Tuesday when she visits Queen Elizabeth in the second in her Scottish castle to be formally appointed. She will become Britain's third female prime minister. OPEC Plus has agreed on a supply cut of 100,000 barrels a day for October. The surprise move reverses September's hike and deals a blow to the Biden administration. The cut is aimed at stabilizing global markets after a faltering economic backdrop triggered the longest price crowd in two years. The cut will take supplies back to August levels. California's strained power grid is set to come under even more stress today because of a punishing heat wave increasing the chance of blackouts. Blisteringly hot temperatures and a rash of wildfires are posing a twin threat to California's power grid. Much of California is under an excessive heat warning for the next four days, with temperatures in Sacramento forecast to crest Tuesday at about 45 degrees Celsius or 114 degrees Fahrenheit. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Angel Feliciano. This is Bloomberg. It's not a surprise. Nobody. Uh should be surprised by uh, this very last decision of the Russian government. We need to be prepared for a total cut of gas supply from Russia. Some commentary from French Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire over the weekend. Russia's Gazprom decided to keep, over the weekend, its main gas pipeline shut, shut indefinitely. The Kremlin says problems with gas flows via the Nord Stream pipeline are due exclusively to sanctions by European nations. Bloomberg's Rachel Morrison leads the team covering power and gas in Europe and joins us now. So, Rachel, we, we had this on Friday. I mean, you can see by the market reaction today. I mean, quite a shock, quite a surprise. Is it a surprise that this has happened, that we've gotten to this point where they've kept Nord Stream shut indefinitely? Well, we were expecting, obviously, after the news for the market to react quite sharply this morning. But as you say, this has been the kind of tactic of Putin throughout to just keep Europe guessing over what's going to happen on the Nord Stream pipeline. So in some ways, we were always prepared for it. And in other ways, it was a complete surprise. But what we can, you know, what policymakers have been saying, what the Germans, what the French have been saying is that we should just plan to not mm. have any flows from Russia for the rest of the winter and plan according to that. What have some of the plans, uh, you know, more to be announced, obviously, but from 
from what we have heard from government so far, what are some of the standout plans, some of the standout options that they're considering? Well, we've heard from Germany and from the Netherlands um, over the weekend and today on how they're going to help consumers deal with rising prices. So obviously when the wholesale price spikes, that feeds into consumer prices eventually as well. So at the moment, policymakers are really concerned with how to um, soften that blow for consumers. And then at an EU level, they're also looking at how to fix that problem in the wholesale market, mm. how to perhaps have a cap on Russian gas prices the way that's been discussed for oil. So there's lots of ideas in the mix, mainly presented by the Czech presidency at the moment, and those will be discussed by the rest of the EU countries, and they'll try to hammer out what um, they're going to do to try to tackle the wholesale price rises. Yeah, and, and I know there's this also talking, you know, City had a note out, just talking about, you know, the huge possibility of margin calls, how collateral requirements are going to move sharply for a lot of these energy suppliers. I know the Nordics has a plan around that. What, what exactly does that look like? Yes, we're seeing this crisis move from just being about prices, which is obviously hugely impactful, to also being about companies. And it's really a tale of two stories. Some companies doing extremely well out of the crisis, selling generation and possibly being subject to a win for tax and on the other side some companies who can hardly trade anymore they need so much cash now because prices are so high to guarantee their trades that they're coming to governments saying we don't have enough liquidity you need to help us you need to back our trades for us you need to give us access to government credit facilities which we've seen in the Nordic region so it'll be so interesting to see if that becomes wider throughout Europe so obviously we're seeing that gas prices spike this morning, but in prior weeks there had been a fall, perhaps some hopefulness around stockpiles that reached, you know, 80% levels, higher levels sooner than expected, especially for places like Germany. To what degree does that shield Europe, or is this just a really short-term Band-Aid? It's both, really. To, so to begin with, yes, that was giving markets a lot of optimism, but the later targets for November are looking less likely to be met because as the weather starts to get cold and the flows of gas we actually use for heating rather than storing, and then we start to take the gas out of storage, it becomes much harder to keep those levels higher. And so depending how cold it is, depending how quickly we burn through the, the stored gas that we have, we could be left in the sort of back half of the winter without you know, as much to rely on in storage, and that's when the problems could potentially come. Okay. Rachel, thank you very much. That's Rachel Morrison there on the energy crisis. And we are looking again at NAT gas at one point spiking 30% up about 18% at the moment. Now, still ahead, climate change is still a priority, and the energy crisis could be a catalyst for a transition to cleaner energy. We're going to hear from U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets. U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, says now is the opportunity to embrace renewables and combat climate change. He sat down with Bloomberg's Haslinda Amin for an exclusive interview in Hanoi. Fuel, uh, gas, oil, uh, has been weaponized by President Putin. Now, in war... Obviously, people go to extremes because of the stakes. What is the best stopgap measure, uh, you think? Because we know that the U.S. has suggested exporting fossil fuels to fill that gap in Europe. Is that not a contradiction to what you're pursuing, no. which is clean energy? It's not as long as it is temporary, as long as it is accompanied by a huge uptick at the rate and the amount of renewable energy that is being deployed. You say, what is the shorthand quick take out of this? It is be as independent as you can in your own energy grid. Get your renewables out there. Uh, begin to wean yourselves from the weapon that is being used against you, which is the dependency on fossil fuel and gas. The thing is, as a result, even Germany is investing in gas facilities right now. Yes, they are. but. Uh, here's the way we at least look at it. There will be gas and oil pumped for some period of time, no matter what. That's cooked in to the rate at which people are now saying we will reduce our emissions. Net zero by 2050. You can do that by using gas to some degree if it replaces coal or replaces oil. 
Why? Because gas is 50% less polluting. So for a period of time, if you're using gas in place of coal, that's a gain. That's a reduction in emissions. But after you reach 2030 or somewhere in that vicinity, in order to get to net zero by 2050, you must be reducing the emissions from the gas. And, and remember, it's only 50% less, not 100. So it's still emissions problems. And I think President Biden understands and his policy embraces the notion we can use gas to transition, but it must be transitional or capturing all of the emissions. And, 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 and so replenishing some of what we needed to keep Europe uh, and its economy humming or to heat homes in very cold places and so forth, that will be necessary in the short term of the transition. But nobody should be fooled into thinking, oh, wow, you know, because of Ukraine, we can just forget about going ahead and deal, dealing with the climate crisis. No, no, and no. I'm convinced the world is going to get to a net zero uh, carbon economy. We will get there. The challenge is will we get there in time to avoid the worst consequences of the crisis? And right now, as you and I sit here, that's not happening. That's our challenge. And over the next weeks, as we go to Sharm el-Sheikh, as we come together in New York, we must agree to accelerate the provision of funding, the sharing of technology, the targets that we're setting in our countries have to grow. We've, we've got to treat this like a war. I mean, literally mobilizing every facet of our economy to deal with it. U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate John Kerry there speaking to Bloomberg's Haslinda Amen in Vietnam. Now let's get to the Bloomberg Business Flash. With that is Angel Feliciano. Angel. Thanks, Danny. UBS has suffered a setback in its quest to make the Swiss wealth manager more digital. The company says the $1.4 billion acquisition of U.S. robo-advisor Wealthfront has collapsed. The deal would have been UBS CEO Ralph Hamer's biggest transaction since taking the reins less than two years ago. Volkswagen is considering selling shares in its initial public offering of Porsche to retail investors across Europe in an attempt to tap customer enthusiasm for the sports car maker. Bloomberg has learned Europe's largest car maker is talking to local banks about offering a portion of stock in the Frankfurt IPO to retail customers in countries including Germany, Austria, Switzerland and France. And that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Danny. Angel, thanks so much. Now, coming up on the program, we're going to get insights on the market from Luke Hickmore, Investment Director at Aberdeen Investment Management. What do you do with Europe? Can you buy at a time when everything's tumbling after Russia cut off Nord Stream flows? This is Bloomberg. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. I'm Danny Berger. Now, it is an ugly start to the week for European trading, all of it hinging off one market in particular. Over here in commodities, Nat Gas Futures at one point jumping 30 percent, currently trimming some of that, but up 15. All of this stemming from Russia on Friday, later in the day, announcing that they would keep Nord Stream 1, the flows through it, closed indefinitely. It is crisis-level reaction that we're seeing across markets as they try to adjust to this new reality. Bond selling off. Italy leading the pack on your GMM screen. Again, will this cause the EC be to tighten even more? Will they have to go beyond 75 basis points to keep inflation in check? Or will they be concentrated on the possibility that gets realer every day of a deep recession? Of course, what does that mean for yields on the periphery? It also means that save for the dollar, currencies are getting crushed today. Euro at 99 cents. At one point, it fell below that the first time uh, since 2002. Now, the krona, that's doing okay as well, considering commodity currencies are able to survive in this. You'll see the bottom of the forex screen we do have the british pound unchanged after uk's new prime minister announced as liz truss perhaps some of that already priced in after the worst month for sterling since the brexit referendum so all of that creating a toxic mix for any risk assets equities throughout europe selling off they did end the day higher on friday before we had learned about that Nord Stream cutoff again it is a drastic readjustment this market might do as we consider not just the energy crisis but the financial and economic 
economic fallout from it. Let's get more on that. Let's get some more market insight and bring in Luke Hickmore, Investment Director at Aberdeen Investment Management. Luke, I mean, it does feel like just this extremely toxic mix from everything from finances, weak currencies to the energy crisis. Is Europe, is it too toxic right now to touch? Can you invest in European assets? It really depends on how much and how long it takes to get through this crisis. If, we'll take more of if we are talking about a deep recession, if we're talking about that problem kind of coming through over the next quarter or two and then well into next year for, for Europe, um, then it is too early. If you can see light at the end of the tunnel as we get into 2024, we may only be a quarter away from actually thinking this is a good time to get involved. The markets tend to be about a year ahead uh, of where the economy is. So, you know, there, there may be that light, but, but right now, today, with all this news flow, uh, it's very difficult to see. Yeah, a year ahead. I mean, Luke, you're describing the necessity for looking two years ahead if you want to see any positivity in this market. I mean, looking at, at some of these government measures, you know, helping households, putting a cap on energy, to what degree, Luke, is this just a Band-Aid and we're going to see persistent issues from here on out? I woke up this morning with exactly that thought, that, you know, hmm. this is morphing into a long-term structural issue that's tough for governments to, to sort out. We're looking at $100 billion being spent by the UK government with Liz Truss and her potential plans to cap the cap. Germany are looking at spending 65 to 70 billion euros at, at, at controlling their own energy crisis over there. That's reflected right across the continent. Fiscal position for governments are going to get worse, and they're getting worse as yields are going higher and interest rates are going higher. That's a toxic mm. environment right now for, for equity and risk investors. Is, is this a doom loop we're going to see for things like sterling, considering we see yields move higher, but that has done absolutely nothing to support cable? I think your point earlier on, Danny, that this has been one of the worst periods for sterling for you know the last five, six, maybe seven, eight years uh, is a fair one. And we haven't seen a lot of reaction to Liz Truss being appointed PM. Um, sterling's not really moved and gilts have not really moved either. And I, it may just be that we're waiting to see the details of what she's going to spend, how it's going to be funded, how much the long end of the gilt market is going to have to take the pain, and what the bank's going to do. So I, it's tough. A doom loop, I'm not sure. There are some natural circuit breakers we could see kick in. Um, one of those is the MPC uh, coming up next week, and, and their comments around a rate rise, uh, which mm. is coming, um, will be incredibly important as a way of of just ensuring that there is some faith they can do something to cure this inflationary problem. I, I mean, Luke, not not to be, you know, the most bearish person ever, but sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm moving that way. I mean, is there anything they can do at this point to, to stop the inflation move we're seeing, considering we just got dealt a fresh blow with the energy crisis throughout Europe? It's not going to be popular but it's a 100 basis point rate hike. Oof. That's what they need to do. And they need to do it next week. They need to surround it with language. We are in control. We are doing things about it. And we are still independent and are going to remain that way through the foreseeable future. Luke, I mean, I do wonder, OK, so if your thesis is one of at least for the next year out, bearish Europe, bearish UK, bearish risk assets there, how is the best way to trade it? Because if we're talking about currencies, it seems like there's probably not a clean short there. If we are going to get, you know, potentially 100 basis points from the BOE, maybe 75 from the ECB, that feels like these short lived moments for FX strength. So how do you actually play bearishness in this market? I have to say this is straight off, Danny, from an FX perspective, I'm an awful FX investor. I always have been. <laughs> I don't even try. I, I hedge FX risk. I don't take FX risk. But I Fair think enough. there are uh, early opportunities in yields in particular. I think considering how bad it could get over the next 12 months, once we've got over the shock and awe about how much fiscal is going to be spent, and we start looking at the economy over the next year, I think you've got to realise that big, quick rate rises now 
lead to probably a shorter pause and actually rate rises being taken off, coming down yeah. again as we get into the tail end of next year. So you know what? Starting to get invested in yield markets, whether that's investment grade, whether that's sovereign in, in many cases, um, right now is not going to be a bad place to be. But you may have to wait two, three years um, before you're proven right. And Luke, of course, you know, U.S. markets offline today, it's a holiday, so no one's watching. So, so that means that you can give us your most controversial take <laughs> on U.S. markets and get no complaints. But tell me, where, how are you viewing U.S. risk assets right now? I mean, to some degree, you know, Europe, U.K. not looking so good. Are, are we back in the land of if you want to invest in equities, you've got to go to the U.S.? Uh, right, uh, this is this is a controversial call, and especially within the company I work for, this is not our house view. <laughs> I work by USIG at this point. You look at hmm. what Sterling IG and Euro IG have done with higher and higher yields. They've moved wider and wider and wider. They have priced in the early stages of a recession. That's not the case for USIG. They, they've not risen at the same pace as yields have risen in the US. And I don't think they're pricing in a serious risk of recession in the US. I would avoid that market right now. I think they're a better value, uh, as I said, in Europe, if you want the depth and if you want specialism in, in Sterling IG. Uh, that's not going to be popular. Um, and it, it's mm. tough for one of the biggest capital markets in the world. Well, what about for US equities? What would make you a buyer there? Uh, it has to be inflation topping off. Um, and, and really, you know, if you want to get involved in the tech industry, if you want to look at, you know, long duration equity assets, you really need to see a top to inflation rolling off the other side. And there are early signs that that may be a pause in the inflationary increases that we've seen over the last six months in particular. But I, I, I argue that we haven't really seen a rolling over of those risks yet. And, and it's going to take that, I think, before we really get there and potentially further earnings revisions looking forward. Mm. Um, they've come down a long way. There, there still seems to me plenty of room for the US to really push earnings down further yet before it's cheap and, and you can get involved. Now, that's probably going to be a right. three handle on the S&P 500. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be a two handle. Uh, whether that's three and a half, three, two, fifty, I don't know. OK, Luke, thank you so much. Coming in hot with the controversial calls this Monday, Luke Hickmore, Investment Director at Aberdeen Investment Management. Now, keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word is Angel Feliciano. Angel. Danny, Liz Truss has won the bitter race to succeed Boris Johnson as UK Prime Minister. The Foreign Secretary emerged victorious today after a two-month Conservative Party leadership contest that started with 11 candidates and concluded with a runoff against former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak. She will become Britain's third female Prime Minister. Europe's energy crisis is deepening. Gas prices surged more than 30 percent today as traders reacted to Russia's decision late Friday to keep its main gas pipeline shut indefinitely. European Union energy ministers are preparing for an emergency meeting this Friday where a number of special measures to rein in soaring prices will be discussed. In Canada, police are searching for two suspects believed to have stabbed to death 10 people in an indigenous community and injuring 15 others. It was one of the deadliest mass killings in the country's history. Officials say they have not determined a motive, but the head of the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations gave a statement suggesting the stabbings could be drug-related. And China has extended its lockdown for most of Chengdu's 21 million residents, with all indoor entertainment venues, schools and dine-in restaurants remaining closed. All of the country's 31 mainland provinces recorded at least one local COVID case over the past 10 days, reflecting the broadest outbreak since at least February 2021, when disclosures started. Global News 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Angel Feliciano. This is Bloomberg.
Credit Suisse's next le legal battle is now unfolding in Singapore. A local subsidiary is being accused by a billionaire client of negligence. Georgian tycoon Bedzina Ivan Nishvila is suing the bank for $800 million in damages and lost income. Bloomberg's Hugo Miller has been following this story for us. So, Hugo, first, talk, this, this billionaire tycoon who is launching this, what, what do we know about him exactly? Well, we've actually got to know him quite well over the last seven years because this whole lawsuit uh, began with a scandal that hit the streets of Geneva back in 2016 when Ivanish, uh, sorry, when uh, the fund manager or relationship manager who, who managed Ivanishvili's money confessed to an almost decade-long fraud, uh, just a series of uh, mistakes uh, he made that he then fundamentally tried to cover up across a range of clients that he managed. And we're now seven years on. Ivanishvili is suing in Singapore, where he had hundreds of millions invested through a, a Credit Suisse trust. And in terms of his history with Credit Suisse, um, in, in other legal proceedings, he's been trying to push towards the bank that others have. What does that tell us, or what has that been, and what does that tell us about the likelihood of him succeeding in his suit against them? Sure. He's been a real thorn in the side of Credit Suisse, to be honest, um, over, over that period. He launched uh, essentially three lawsuits, primarily in Singapore, New Zealand, and uh, the current, uh, and then one in Bermuda. Um, New Zealand was actually thrown out because the judge there accepted uh, the argument from the bank that Switzerland, none of those three island nations, was really the jurisdiction um, for any litigation. But he won big, and he, in Bermuda, uh, a trial was held in February. A similar case, he made the allegations that a local life insurance trust in Bermuda had simply been negligent and should have spotted the fraud. And he won big to the tune of $600 million. Credit Suisse, of course, is appealing that. But for now, that $600 million verdict stands, um, and, and Credit Suisse had to cough up that money, and it's now held in escrow pending an appeal. So, so what then is the risk for Credit Suisse on, on, the, on this one specific trial, Hugo? The figure is significant, $800 million. Uh, but I think what's more significant is, I mean, that's an amount of money that uh, many Wall Street banks could, could swallow in, in provisions and write-downs. The trouble is that this comes on top of Ivanishvili's win in March and just a series of mistakes that have cost the bank um, significantly, as you our readers know Credit Suisse was at the heart of um, the Archegos and the green sale scandals. And so what's really happening is you've got this kind of mounting inbox of legal headaches and right and provisions that the bank is having to account for at a time when it is not firing on all cylinders like many of its rivals. And so disproportionately speaking, these legal costs are, are, are really um, adding up for the bank. And, and, and Hugo, I mean, as you're pointing out, this is, this is not Credit Suisse's first brush with controversy in the headlines. W what does it mean in terms of looking at reputational risk for Credit Suisse, again, as you point out, that seems to have been piling? Yeah, I think it's, it's significant. Um, what the judge in the Bermuda uh, trial ultimately decided was that the life insurance uh, business that, that managed Ivanishvili's money had uh, turned what he called a blind eye uh, to Patrice Lescadron, the fraudster's uh, activities. Um, and when any potential client is looking at Credit Suisse or UBS or an American bank to, to park their assets, they're going to remember that. And it's not just Ivanishvili. There was a half dozen other uh, wealthy Russians uh, who also had their money in money managed by Lescadron, and they're equally angrily angry. They just don't have as deep a pocket. But essentially, you do have a real reputational risk the bank is facing. Uh, people mm. are thinking twice. Uh, is this a safe place? Credit Suisse says they never knew anything about Lescadron's fraud, that he hid it from his colleagues, uh, and that they've made uh, enormous steps to, to rectify the compliance problems they had. But as you say, right. reputational risks, uh, brand, uh, reputations have a, have a way of getting, uh, taking a while to, to be um, uh, recovered. Okay. Hugo, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Hugo Miller there on the latest on Credit Suisse.
Coming up on the program, oil jumps after OPEC Plus agreed to cut oil output start starting next month. We're just hearing from Russia's Alexander Novak saying that the proposed cap on Russian oil is adding uncertainty. Of course, saying there it's not just growth, it's Europe's actions. We'll have details next. This is Bloomberg. Oil jumping today after OPEC Plus agreed to a surprise supply cut. The group agreed to curb output by 100,000 barrels a day starting in October. Russia's energy minister Alexander Novak says OPEC Plus has a range of tools to balance the oil market and that the proposed cap on Russian oil is adding uncertainty. Let's bring in Will Kennedy, Bloomberg senior executive editor for energy and commodities. So, Will, I mean, you know, facts on the ground, 100,000 barrels, not that significant in terms of actual volume. So what, what is the significance of it? I think symbolically it's very significant for two reasons. Uh, a month ago they raised production by the same amount, which was seen as a response to White House lobbying for OPEC and its partners to do something about higher oil prices. And they've seen fit to uh, reverse that within just a month, which will probably not make Washington very happy. Uh, the other significance is I think OPEC is very clearly saying that we can go in both directions to manage the market. Since the pandemic, it's all been about putting oil back into the market, resupplying the market. But here, I think they're signaling, you know what? The market should be aware we, should, we can go both ways. We stand ready to respond quickly to changes in uh, the outlook. Uh, I think there's a little bit of concern about demand. Mm. So hence, yes, a very small production in numbers, but significant symbolically. Yeah, of course, you know, they said they're willing to call another meeting to address the market at, at any time. So are we about to see a more flexible, more quick acting OPEC than we have? It looks like that. The Saudi minister, uh, Prince Abdulaziz, has always been keen to meet monthly to be very active, obviously, by keeping the conference open and saying, I can call a meeting whenever I like. He's adding to that, and it's clearly a way of keeping the market on its toes. We've got a lot of uncertainty over the next few months when you look at the energy crisis in Europe, when we look Look at what's going to happen to the wider global economy, COVID in China, um, the war in Ukraine. So it's not surprising that OPEC is keeping its options open. You mentioned that this is a reversal from what they had done after some significant lobbying from mm. the U.S. to increase output. What will the U.S. response to this likely be? I think that they will uh, probably pay lip service to the relationship. They won't want to burn their bridges. I suspect inside there'll be a bit of um, disappointment. but. Uh, it's worth remembering that oil prices and more importantly gasoline prices in the US have come down a long way from where they were over the summer when Washington was incredibly anxious. Um, so it's a slightly different environment. Will they want oil to go much higher than here? Absolutely not. It's striking a balance as always between the needs of consumers and the need of producers. I'm also looking at some lines right now from the EU's Borrell saying that the Iran nuclear talks are diverging, not converging, saying I'm less confident today on closing an Iran deal. deal. I and mean, we also heard from the U.S. last week seeming sounding less confident yeah. in Iran deal. So, I mean, is this something, has it been completely priced out of the market? Uh, it's an important point. I think that the market has been driven a lot by Iran headlines in the last couple of weeks. And I think that one of the reasons that OPEC wants to maintain flexibility is because just in case it gets those extra Iranian barrels into the market. But it does seem that there are a lot of hurdles towards an Iranian deal and that the market should not be counting on those barrels necessarily anytime soon. And as well as OPEC's willingness to uh, cut, I think for perhaps the fading prospects for a quick Iran deal is one reason why we've seen oil tick higher today. And well, just about a minute here, but I wanted to go back to these lines from Novak, basically saying a proposed cap on Russian oil adds uncertainty. Are you surprised by that line? What do you make of sort of the noise we're hearing around Russia when it comes to oil output? So the G7 uh, said quite clearly on Friday that it wants to pursue this plan to cap the price of oil exports uh, from Russia using the insurance and shipping market to insist that people buy Russian oil, they only pay a certain price. Now, Russia has said quite clearly that it won't allow this to happen, that if people do this, it won't sell oil at the, on that basis. Uh, Clearly, it's another thing in this complicated uh, febrile market that's adding uncertainty. Um, if the price cap is pushed heavily, uh, it will be interesting to see what that does to Russian exports. 
All right. Will, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Will Kennedy giving us all the latest on oil. I also want to bring us, as we're talking about Russia, a line just crossing the Bloomberg now that Russia risks longer, deeper recession. That according to an internal government report, of course. A deeper recession is what we're all facing with in Europe at the moment as the energy crisis unfolds. We're going to bring all of that to our guests coming up in the next hour. We're going to have SD Dweck, CIO of Flowbank, as well as Samuel Toombs, chief UK economist at Pantheon Macroeconomics. In an ugly day for Europe, basically only things moving higher are not gas and oil. Brent up by 4%. This is Bloomberg. It's 10 a.m. in New York, 3 p.m. in London. U.S. markets closed for the Labor Day holiday. Here are the top market stories we are following for you at this hour. Liz Trust wins. Trust clinches the Tory leadership to become the U.K.'s next prime minister, promising to cut taxes. Sterling is steady. Europe's energy catastrophe. EU leaders race to find solutions to the energy crunch as Gazprom decides to keep a key pipeline shut indefinitely. Russian Energy Minister Alexander Novak says the proposed price cap on Russian oil is adding uncertainty. And energy fallout. European stocks slump. Euro retreats to a two-decade low and gas prices surge with no clear solution in sight for the crisis. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Happy Monday. I'm Danny Berger. Now let's start with that top story in the UK. Liz Truss will become the next prime minister after winning the Conservative Party leadership race. Let's get straight to 10 Downing Street where our Lizzie Burden is standing by. Lizzie, so we've heard from Liz Truss that quick short speech from her. What were some of our main takeaways behind her victory and what she said? Well, Danny, she was very much still appealing to the Tory voters who chose her as leader. She had said she admired her friend Boris Johnson, who was admired from Kiev to Carlisle, a line which prompted a silence that's typical of trust speeches. And she also said that her priorities were cutting taxes, dealing with energy, the National Health Service, so very much addressing that Tory core. But she's going to have to pivot her message to the general public if she wants to stay in power because she's going to have to call a general election by January 2025. if she uh, is to, to stay on, and Labour at the moment would win a general election, uh, she's going to have to broaden her message because more than half of UK households fail, face fuel poverty uh, at the moment. And because of that, we've got double digit inflation at the moment. It hasn't even peaked. And the Bank of England is expecting two years of negative or zero economic growth. Uh, so, what we're expecting to come up are, is a package on the scale of the the furlough scheme in in the COVID pandemic uh, and also a freeze on energy bills. But the problem with that, Danny, would be that it would be very expensive, it wouldn't be very targeted and it wouldn't do much to help businesses. Okay, Lizzie, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden there at 10 Downing Street. Let's get now into the markets, how how the markets are reacting. Bloomberg MLive editor Nora Al-Ali joins us now. Uh, Nora, I got to say, I mean, pretty calm in UK markets compared to some of the drama we're seeing elsewhere. Sterling even a little bit higher at the moment. Cable's at 115. Is this is this just already all priced in a Liz Trust PM? Uh, I think to to an extent it it is somewhat priced in today. Remember, it is a U.S. holiday today, so perhaps it's thin trading altogether here. But, you know, you have had the pound surge, what, 15 percent so far this year against the dollar. You look at U.K. yields across the curve there, and you can see that the short end has been selling off a lot more aggressively than bonds and USDs in recent weeks. And that's because they're pricing in that risk of those fiscal policies that Trust has been touting. Now the question is, whether or not she will continue or follow through with them. And, you know, to that point, it it, it is all about King Dollar at this moment, isn't it? You know, every now and then I feel like we get folks in the program who are willing to make a big call, big, bold call saying, okay, maybe it'll peak. I mean, are those arguments valid that King Dollar is going to lose its crown anytime soon? You know, it's... 
It's, it's very tough to tell you yes or not in this situation because both the bulls and the bears both have very strong cases for them. You know, in terms of king dollar, where else would you go? Where else would you park your money? You were looking at the European continent. You're looking at the euro, turning at 99 cents against the dollar. And the pound, not too far off from parity right now. Where else would you go in terms of G10 FX? It's very hard to see anywhere else but the dollar as the trade to go, at least for the time being. All right, Nora, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Nora Al Ali there. Let's add another voice to the conversation. Joining us now is Esti Dweck, CIO of Flow Bank. Esti, do you think that's right? Nor was just telling us that essentially the only place you can go in G10 is the dollar. Does that still hold true today? Well, for now, it does certainly hold true. Uh, we've seen, you know, some other currencies hold up, including the Swiss franc, where you have uh, the Swiss National Bank sort of finally decoupling from the ECB, wanting to fight inflation, even though it's sort of Switzerland certainly doesn't have the same inflation problem as some of the other countries. But that willingness to, to hike rates, if needed, is really supporting the Swiss franc, which is one of the only currencies that has held up against the dollar. But in the scope of the biggest currencies, um, I don't see the dollar weakening much against euro or sterling for a little while. And, and in terms of what we need to price in in political risk, SD, is it all priced in in cable when we've seen, you know, declines last month that were the worst since the Brexit referendum? Is, is all the bad news already baked into the picture? There's some expectations that uh, Liz Truss is going to trigger Article 16, that you're going to have some things happening uh, with the, the Irish protocol. So some of that is already priced in. How she does it and to what extent it brings the whole Brexit agreement into question, I think, suggests we could see further volatility. And there's also something of, you know, a little uncertainty. We haven't had a lot of details on some of the policies she wants to do, and a lot of them are feeling quite inflationary. So we have to see if the market sees that for cable as a positive, because it means the Bank of England has to hike, or just uh, a big gamble that's very risky in the current situation. If, if we do see, SD, I mean, inflation of 22 percent next year, which, of course, is, is Goldman's forecast, should we see no change in the current trajectory of nat gas prices, 22 percent inflation in the U.K.? Bring me forward to that. If you were to invest around it, what needs to do the most serious repricing in U.K. assets? Well, the, the big thing is the FTSE historically, and even this year, has really traded much more with global equities than around UK headlines. It was, it was you know, not a great week last week, but again, the FTSE 100 will broadly follow global growth and global indices. Domestic stocks in the UK are at much more risk. So those companies that don't have the pricing power, that are dependent on uh, smaller uh, or lower wage earners and their shopping, we've already seen in the US, you know, that shift in where people are putting their money, any companies that are gonna be uh, away from that, so lower end retail, uh, that gets that suffers. I think we're going to continue to see pressure there uh, because inflation will eat at margins and sh consumers will shift their spending patterns. Well, perhaps one of the saving grace for UK stocks, again, not the domestic story, SD, as you point out, is the fact that it has so much exposure to energy. Now, European energy stocks in general have rallied something like 25 percent this year. Would you still be a buyer in this market or has that run its course? Well, we're seeing uh, oil prices dip a little bit, so we could see uh, an impact on the energy sector at the moment. But uh, a lot of energy companies, both in the U.S. and in Europe, hadn't caught up to oil prices before the war in the Ukraine. So there was still upside potential there. So we've seen a big, big part of the move, but it doesn't feel like prices can fall much, much below 80 uh, for the oil price. And that suggests that there's still a lot of strong earnings to come through for energy. And we're probably not, uh, unless you really have a very strong recessionary uh, sort of panic in the markets, I think energy, the energy sector will continue to do well. I, I do wonder if there, there in, in terms of the panic, what you're laying out, which could drastically change the so certainly a risk that is present. We're going to continue to talk more about that. This is Bloomberg.
world. Here's the first word. I'm Angel Feliciano. Liz Truss has won the bitter race to succeed Boris Johnson as UK Prime Minister. The Foreign Secretary emerged victorious today after a two-month Conservative Party leadership contest that started with 11 candidates and concluded with a runoff against former Chancellor of the Exchequer Rishi Sunak. Truss made a short speech after the results were announced. And my friends, we need to show that we will deliver over the next two years. I will deliver a bold plan to cut taxes and grow our economy. I will deliver on the energy crisis, dealing with people's energy bills, but also dealing with the long-term issues we have on energy supply. Trust won't take power until Tuesday when she visits Queen Elizabeth II in her Scottish castle to be formally appointed. She will become Britain's third female prime minister. OPEC Plus has agreed on a supply cut out of 100,000 barrels a day for October. The surprise move reverses September's hike and deals a blow to the Biden administration. The cut is aimed at stabilizing global markets after a faltering economic backdrop triggered the longest price route in two years. The cut will take supplies back to August levels. A suicide bombing outside the Russian embassy in the Afghan capital of Kabul today has killed two members of the embassy staff and at least one Afghan civilian. Moscow denounced the blast as, quote, an unacceptable terrorist act. There was no immediate claim of responsibility for the blast, the latest in a series of attacks since the Taliban seized power a year ago. And California's strained power grid is set to come under even more stress today because of a punishing heat wave increasing the chance of black Blackouts. Blisteringly hot temperatures and a rash of wildfires are posing a twin threat to California's power grid. Much of California is under an excessive heat warning for the next four days, with temperatures in Sacramento forecast to crest Tuesday at about 45 degrees Celsius or 114 degrees Fahrenheit. Global News 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Angel Feliciano. This is Bloomberg. Danny? Angel, thank you so much. Now let's get a check on these markets because it continues to be an extremely difficult trading session to start your week, all dominated by the giant jump we saw, we've seen this morning in that gas prices. Of course, this in reaction to Russia Friday, saying that they will shut the flow of gas through Nord Stream 1 to Europe indefinitely. Now, this market was closed when that happened, so we had a pretty big gut punch reaction, up 30%. That has moderated, but still the impact being felt across assets. Euro, that versus the dollar at 99 cents. Goldman says it could go to 97 cents. It is a persistent weakness and at its lowest level uh, since 2002. Sterling, that little change after Liz Truss announced the next prime minister at one point is trading with 114 handle its weakest since 1985. So over Overall, it is a risk off picture. It is sell everything in Europe with stocks Europe 600 down eight tenths of 1% as well. Now, still with us is SD Dweck, CIO of Flow Bank. I mean, SD continue to see sell off in Europe, perhaps not as steep as it was to start the trading day. But is Europe now a toxic asset? Would you be willing to trade to buy risk in the continent? Not today. We, we see that it is so dependent on the energy picture and on the gas flows. We don't know if and when uh, Russia will turn it back on, and we know they're going to keep playing these games, uh, even if this is just a few days into the winter. Uh, the other thing is that while the storage levels are better than expected and are filling up faster, that's storage for the winter months. But if we get cut off before, we're going to need to use those storage levels or that use that storage, those reserves faster. And that makes it another very complicated picture uh, for Europe. So the euro is bearing the brunt of it, but not a lot of uh, good news coming out of the old continent right now. And of course, a huge part of that euro weakness has been one of a dollar's parabolic move, essentially uh, against everything. And it's interesting, Esti, right now, uh, Das from the RBI, the RBI governor there from uh, the Bank of India is speaking, essentially saying that it is difficult to give foreign guidance in the current environment, in the current uncertainty, essentially pinning it to Jackson Hole, pinning it to the Fed, injecting volatility in the market, and that their commentary has large spillover effects 
on emerging markets. I mean, Esty, it is a story that many central bank chiefs are faced with of a hawkish Fed, meaning that their currencies are extremely weak. Are we about to see a period of more currency intervention as everyone from India, Japan, Europe, UK is faced with this reality? This, that's possible. I mean, we're certainly seeing uh, very strong ripple effects from the Jackson Hole speech and generally from the Fed's stance for the last six months, right? Jackson Hole was perceived as more hawkish than, than many had hoped for, but it wasn't that big of a change of tone other than re-emphasizing that rates are going to stay higher for longer. Uh, that puts a lot of pressure on emerging markets in particular and emerging market central banks who need to intervene or who need to hike to keep their currencies in a way competitive uh, against the dollar. And at some point, even though some weakness can help with exports, um, it doesn't help. Now, the fact that we're seeing some weakness in the renminbi is certainly not helping emerging market and Asian currencies either. And that type of, of loop where you see higher yields but yet a weaker currency, I mean, that brings us, SD to what many people say are emerging market type trading for both sterling and for the euro. Now, now, you mentioned in terms of current accounts that a weaker currency might help there. When you look at the UK, Europe with really stark deficits, is there not some degree to which central banks need to keep a weak currency again to try to help their capital accounts? Well, we see that a little bit, but the reality is we're in an environment where everyone knows central banks need to fight inflation. We know that if you take the example of the UK, growth uh, needs to be supported. And we've seen even with the US that the market is not as concerned, uh, certainly for the developed economies, with the public finances as they are for emerging markets. It's not as much of a factor as many expected it to be, or maybe as uh, it has been in the past. And so that gives a little bit of leeways uh, for these central banks not to be solely focused on that and really just keep an eye on that inflation picture. The debate, of course, coming for the ECB, for the decision later this week, SD, is, is which to prioritize. Is it inflation or is it a looming recession? What do you make of it? Which way is the ECB going to tend towards when it comes to their meeting on Thursday? The ECB has one very clear mandate, and that is inflation. So even though they have very little control over energy prices, and that's the main problem for inflation right now, they still have to act. Now, their second mandate isn't about growth, it's about financial stability. So we're going to see what happens with the Italian elections, we'll see what happens with yields. Maybe uh, if the ECB is uh, particularly hawkish on Thursday, they can give some more details on their new tool and give some clarity there that can maybe ease uh, some of the concerns for the market. But uh, the market is pricing in seven or closer to pricing in 75 basis points. And if we give it to the ECB, I think they'll just take it um, and get that one done already. I see just doing some quick math here, which I'm remarkably bad at for someone who enjoys uh, spending her time in Excel. Uh, looking at the central bank tightening, we're expecting this, uh, this you know, coming decisions, BOE, you know, 75 basis points, RBI, RBA rather, 50 basis points, ECB, 75 perhaps. But even if it's just 50, adding those together, it means we're going to get an average G10 policy rate of 1.5%, which would be the highest level since February 2009 when we start to see stocks tumble and in about face from central banks. This time around, it feels like we're not going to stop there, Esty. Do global markets, do we really have a grasp on the fallout from that, on, on speculative assets and, and, and things like the housing market? Well, when you look at what the markets have done this year, you clearly see that the pain came early because the Fed warned us pretty much since March that they were going to have to hike and they were going to have to hike a lot. And then in May and June, and then obviously into July, they just kept increasing that rate. So well, I think we're pricing in a lot of that. Uh, you were mentioning some of the other central banks, but even after Jackson Hole, if you look at the Fed, the expectation for the Fed fund rates didn't move up so much for the end of the year. The markets were already pricing sort of 50, 25, 25. Now it's maybe 75, 25, 25. The ECB expectations have gone up a little bit. The Bank of England's have been at 75 for a while. So this isn't new news for the markets. And we've certainly priced in quite a bit of tightening, 
quite a bit of an impact on valuations, and you can see that, uh, that across a lot of sectors. So unless you, we really need to see a lot more tightening than what's currently being priced in by the markets, I think equities are already pricing in a lot of the fallout from what we're seeing. Okay. Esti, great to get your thoughts this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. That's Esti Dweck, CIO of Flow Bank. Still ahead on the program, Pierre Paolo Ramondi, former Veneto Blanca board member, will discuss the energy fallout with him next as Russia cuts off flow through Nord Stream 1 indefinitely. This is Bloomberg. European equities and the euro fell shortly after Gazprom shut a key Nord Stream pipeline indefinitely. French Fino Minister Bruno Le Maire spoke at the Ambrosetti Forum in Italy. It's not a surprise. Nobody uh, should be surprised by uh, this very last decision of the Russian government. We need to be prepared for a total cut of gas supply from Russia. And we have been preparing that kind of uh, decision with President Macron, with uh, many other member states over the last weeks and the last month. So we must be prepared, which means reducing our gas consumption. This is the first thing to do. Then diversifying our supply chains. That's exactly what we are doing now. And also trying to build for the future new energy production, thanks to uh, renewable energies and nuclear energy. So don't be surprised. We all expected that kind of decisions, and we will be prepared. And the decision yesterday by the G7 to impose a price cap on Russian oil, how much do you think this is going to reduce the oil income, the income for Russia? Uh, I think that the purpose is uh, really to reduce oil revenues for Russia, because we don't want to put sanctions against Russia, and on the other side, to have Russia benefiting of uh, revenues uh, from oil or from gas. So the idea of capping the price of oil is, I think, the right one. And the fact that the G7 decided to move on that direction is really very good news. Then there remains uh, three points that must be fixed over the next uh, weeks. Uh, the first one uh, is, of course, to get the unanimity of the 27 member states of the EU, because if you want to change the rules of the six package, you need the unanimity of the 27 member states. And let's be clear, um, it's not, you cannot take that for granted. The second point is the outreach. We need to convince other partners outside the G7 to join that initiative, because we don't want that G7 initiative to be a Western initiative against uh, Russia. We want this uh, capping of our price to be a global initiative against war in Ukraine. That's totally different. And the third point is uh, a technical point, but a quite important one, which is how to define the level of price that uh, might be uh, required. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets. We're an hour away from the European close. It is an ugly session. And joining us to give us an update on some of that ugliness is Bloomberg MY's editor, Noor Al Ali. And, and, and maybe, you know, I'm over egging it a bit. It is a tough session, though, to start the week. I mean, one asset decisively in the green, though, is oil. So OPEC, it makes this cut 100,000 barrels in the month of next month. I mean, it, it, it's pretty minuscule in terms of volume. What do you make of the pretty sizable market reaction. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that reaction is on the back front or, or, you know, reaction to, you know, the European energy crisis as a whole. We did see, you know, Russia cut its key Nord Stream pipeline to Europe, and that has really definitely swayed the markets in that oil for gas substitution. The cut from OPEC plus is definitely symbolic. You've seen prices come down generally for oil, as, as that chart shows, and you've seen that come down from June. And OPEC has said repeatedly, or at least the leader of OPEC has said, we're not really happy about lower prices, lows lower prices, because they are not reflecting the tightness in the market. Saudi Arabia, one of the biggest, obviously, producers of oil in the world, they lead OPEC production. You know, their production really outpaces or surpasses pretty much any other producer in OPEC. And you can see, obviously, that sentiment carrying through that sentimentality of, of that cut today. 
So perhaps a, a little bit of a repricing in terms of this oil market from that fall. We had seen, of course, the other market that's decisively up, Nat Gas, Dutch Nat Gas front month futures up 15%. I mean, it was up 30% at one point today, so sort of the worst of it perhaps priced out. I wonder how much of that is about some of the government measures we might see, and if, if not, how markets should be thinking about possible government intervention and support. You know, let's take the UK for an example, because the UK is one of these cases where you see the prices of that energy crisis really playing out in the market. We've had all Jump raise its price caps back in you know earlier this month for for re, for for residential consumers, but businesses are still dealing that burnt of those higher prices. Some of them are dealing with 11-fold higher costs than they typically paid, and that will definitely feed into that inflationary picture that we're seeing in the UK and also in Europe. And that puts into question whether or not central banks can respond as aggressively as possible as we now start seeing, you know, governments or, you know, prime ministers that are incoming like trusts who are now touting ideas of, you know, fiscal policies that will support the economy in this very difficult time. Okay, Noor, thank you so much. As always, that's Bloomberg's Noor Ali from our markets team. Now, that energy crisis, it's one of the many challenges facing Liz Truss, which, as we learned of midday in the UK, will become the next prime minister. According to Bloomberg Economics, rocketing energy costs mean inflation peaking close to 15% in January. Joining us now is Elizabeth Martins, chief UK economist at HSBC. And Liz, in terms of what we've learned from Liz Truss as to how she plans to tackle this, we just heard a five-minute speech from her, so really short on specific details. We're more likely potentially to get something next uh, tomorrow, or at least this is the first order of business. What are you expecting uh, from the incoming prime minister when it comes comes to tackling the energy crisis in the UK? Well, first of all, I think she said she'll lay out a plan within the next week. Um, and then I think by the end of the month, we'll probably have a full budget in the UK. So we'll know a lot more then. Um, but I think it falls into two kind of categories. First, the tax cuts that we do know about, because we heard a lot about them in the campaign period, the reversal of the national insurance hike, the cancellation of the planned corporation tax rise, and a moratorium on the green energy levy. So that's the first plank. She's talked a lot about that. Um, she said she prefers cutting taxes to, to hand money out um, as transfers. Um, but that's not enough. It's not going to go nearly far enough to offset the shock of higher energy prices for households and businesses. So we also think there'll have to be a package of measures uh, along those lines as well. Now, she's been much more tight-lipped about how she would deal with those, um, apart from saying she prefers tax cuts to, um, to transfers to handouts. Um, but I think, you know, lots of things under consideration, energy rebate, mm. um, like Rishi Sunak talked about, um, VAT on household energy, but also more drastically, uh, the prospect of an energy price freeze. So keeping um, household energy prices lower than they would be uh, if they rise with the uh, with the off gem cap in October. So that's the really interesting one, I think. Uh, Elizabeth, you know, it, it has been said, and, you know, we we're talking with SD Dweck just earlier uh, about the issues the UK is going to face in terms um, of its public finances. You have this immense spending coming in at a time where the BOE is set to hike interest rates. Some people expect that they should go 100 basis points, or they should. What does it mean for public finances? Can they support the spending again as we see interest rates move into more restrictive territory? Yeah, it's really, really tricky. Normally in a recession or in the pandemic, in the global financial crisis, you had a huge fiscal response from the government. But at the same time, the BOE was cutting rates, buying bonds, making it all very smooth sailing. It's the opposite this time. The BOE is hiking rates uh, and, and potentially about to start selling bonds. As well as that, we've got inflation, which is pushing up on a lot of other government spending. Debt is linked to inflation. Um, other, some benefit spending is linked to inflation. So um, it's a bit of a vicious circle. And I do think that it's a very it, 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 it's kind of untested to be honest we haven't really tried active sales of bonds from the boe before it happens at a time when demand um for for gilts is, is not quite as dependable as it used to be things like the pension funds foreign investors not quite as um keen as maybe they, they once were and, and and dependable so i think it, you know it does it does um make for some quite tricky fiscal maths. And the other thing that I think is at risk is the fiscal targets. You know, the UK has a mandate to balance the books or the current budget over three years. And I think, you know, probably mm. when, when the next Chancellor comes in with the new budget, um, they will have to either say, you know, we're suspending the rules because this is an emergency, it's, it's very different circumstances, or perhaps right. we're changing them to something a bit easier to achieve. 
Well, when it, when it comes to guilt, Liz, we do see 25 to 30 percent of that market being held by foreign investors. It doesn't seem like that's able to attract any inflows, given the, the spike higher that is in yields, considering that sterling keeps falling. Is there a level that the BOE can get yields to that they can raise rates that might eventually attract again that foreign inflow? Look, I'm not a guilt market uh, expert. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there is a level at some point. I don't know what that level um, might be. But I think, you know, it's about a number of factors, isn't it? Supply and demand of, of guilts in the market, but also confidence in the UK public finances um, and the UK economy more broadly. Um, and I do think, yeah, we are, we, you know, we are in a situation at the moment where the fiscal maths is looking uh, a little bit tricky. OK, Elizabeth, thank you very much for joining us today. That's Elizabeth Mertens, HSBC chief UK economist. Coming up, we're going to get more on Europe's energy crisis with Pierre Paolo Ramondi, former Veneto Banca board member, who will join us next. This is Bloomberg. Last month, OPEC Plus agreed to increase oil output in the near future, but today it voted to cut daily output by 100,000 barrels as policymakers make drastic changes in reaction to the global energy crisis. Now, speaking of which, EU energy ministers will meet Friday to discuss solutions to curb energy demand in coming months. Russia inde indefinitely halted the Nord Stream pipeline, cutting san citing sanctions imposed by the EU and UK as the reason. Bloomberg's Rachel Morrison joins us now and covers energy for Bloomberg. Um, Rachel, so what sort of position is Europe in now? Now that Russia said they're going to stop the flow indefinitely, how dire does it look? Well, we had reduced flows on the Nord Stream pipeline before. So really, in terms of actual flows, it's not a huge cut. But what it really shows is that we may not get those flows back at all. The reasons that Russia is giving are sanctions and a kind of oil leak that they found. But a photo that we saw of the oil leak didn't look particularly serious. So we can, we can really see that now this is what Russia is using as kind of leverage over Europe to try to get um, an easing of sanctions. So Europe can re is really sort of starting to realise that it cannot count on any mm. flows of Russian gas for the rest of the winter. That would be the, the kind of base case. Well, well, to that point, Rachel, we're getting some breaking lines just at this minute. I want to bring them to you from von der Leyen, not just talking about caps in terms of Russian oil, but saying the EU will cap price of Russian pipeline gas. Von, von der Leyen also saying that the EU will help electricity producers with liquidity. Now, that, that liquidity piece, Rachel, it is something we've heard the Nordics talk about to help when it comes to collateral. So taking this all into account, what does it look like the direction we're heading in when we get uh, the energy, energy ministers meeting later in the week, the solutions that they're going to propose? They have a lot to discuss, and we are seeing a lot of different proposals coming out. The Czech presidency has brought out some proposals. And then what remains to be seen is which of those stick and gather support. So price caps that you mentioned, that could either be in the wholesale market or a kind of cap on just Russian gas, which would be interesting. We've seen it in oil, but it's difficult to do. And there seems to be some talk about trying to separate that out from the European price to kind of keep it from having too much influence on European prices. And then there's the consumer part, which the EU is also looking at with great urgency, how to reduce bills for people, because winter's coming, there's going to be huge energy bills landing for, for everyone across Europe. So they're looking at both parts. And then the companies, you know, whilst all of this is happening, European companies are struggling, and that would be even more disastrous and have a sort of contagion effect if some of the energy suppliers start to get into financial difficulties. Yeah, like the Finnish minister said, the possibility of, of a Lehman-like moment for the energy market. Rachel, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Rachel Morrison there. Now, turning to some of the broader impacts of this global energy crisis, the aluminum industry is calling for government assistance to stay afloat. European production has dropped to the lowest levels since the 1970s, and industry insiders say the escalating energy crisis is now threatening to create an extinction event 
across aluminum production. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Jack Farchi, who wrote about this over the weekend. I mean, Jack, an extinction event. To what degree is this hyperbole versus a likely outcome for this metals industry? Um, I don't think it is hyperbole, to be honest with you. I mean, the, the, the key thing to remember about aluminium is that it's extremely energy intensive to make aluminium. It involves running a lot of power through a pot full of molten metal. Uh, it takes about 15 megawatt hours to make a ton of aluminium, which for context is about the, enough to, to, to deliver power to five German households for a whole year. Um, and so when energy prices, as we've seen in Europe, rocket much, much higher, smelting aluminium simply doesn't make economic sense anymore. And so we're going to see a situation where unless aluminium smelters have major government support or they have captive energy supplies, for example, in Iceland, uh, there's a big aluminium smelting industry that uses geothermal energy, uh, and I'm sure they'll be fine. Um, possibly Norway with its uh, hydropower supplies. Uh, but other than that, uh, the, the industry is really in a, in a, in a total crisis. Jack, has the market accurately priced this in? Is there a big readjustment that's going to need to unfold if, if it is crisis coming for the industry? I mean, I don't think it's a huge deal for global aluminium prices. The EU is uh, a relatively small part of aluminium production. Uh, you know, China is the big aluminium producer. The EU accounts for, I think, it's something like 1.5% of global aluminium production. So at the end of the day, EU production falling is a bit of a rounding error for the world. For Europe and for European industry, it matters an awful lot because these are the aluminium smelters that produce aluminium, which is then turned into parts for cars, for planes, uh, in, for, for defence uh, uses. So it's the, it's the beginning point of a huge supply chain that feeds a whole load of European factories. And I think European politicians really need to consider. I mean, I know they've got a lot of things to consider at the moment. They need to consider uh, consumers, uh, other companies, all the rest of it. But they really need to consider which parts of these supply chains do you want to preserve and do you want to save in this winter and possibly several winters ahead that are going to be very difficult and very expensive? Okay, Jack, important context. Thank you so much. Bloomberg's Jack Farchi there. Great piece, by the way. Really recommend everyone go and read that. Adding another voice to the conversation, joining us now is Pierre Paolo Ramondi, former Veneto Banca board member. Currently, he's a researcher in the energy program at the IAI. And, and Pierre, what you're studying at the moment, energy, climate, and resources program. I mean, how far away from the textbooks are we? How far away are, from, are we from historical precedent and flying blind do we find ourselves in this current environment? Yeah, today the EU is finding itself in uh, the worst energy crisis since uh, 1973. Uh, the issue is also that we are facing a different context because uh, energy markets in Europe have uh, liberalized during the past decades. And so we are seeing also the comeback of the state, uh, as you already talked about. Uh, and so this is um, unprecedented, uh, unprecedented events, uh, also because we are in the middle of the energy transition. So we will need to see how the EU will deliver its uh, energy transition as well. And the Finnish economy minister warned that this, in a way, has the ingredients for an energy industry Lehman Brothers moment. Pierre, do you think that it is very likely that we could see a contagion Lehman-like moment hit the energy industry? We already see some companies uh, asking for bailouts. And so mm. it's probably that uh, in several countries, uh, uh, energy companies and energy intensive uh, companies uh, uh, will need to ask help for uh, for government support and government money. Uh, the issue is to find the right balance between protecting the consumers and protecting the industry uh, as well as uh, uh, the climate. Hmm. And, and to that point, Pierre, I mean, obviously the drama we're seeing, which is, you know, perhaps not the best way to put it, but for lack of better words, the drama we're seeing in today's market has to do with the fact that Russia flow through Nord Stream 1 has halted. But that's not the only issue. You have weather, uh, meaning in France, some of the nuclear plants can't rise and more demand uh, for cooling as we have a very hot summer and then what that all means for the winter. I mean, Pierre, it, it's climate change. To what degree are some of the proposals just a band-aid and not going to fix some of the long-term stresses that we will have because of that? 
the uh, the topic is the uh, the the issue. The main issue is that um, we are seeing uh, multiple crises. Uh, uh, people are, are getting used to a multiple crisis, climate crisis uh, that affects hydropower, uh, nuclear power, um, and now the gas crisis. Um, the the critical aspect is to find the balance between uh, protecting uh, the consumers, and here it's crucial to ask uh, the reduction of demand because we are in a tight uh, gas market, and so there are not enough uh, volumes as of today to replace all the Russian gas. So not enough volumes to replace the Russian gas. You have a populace who's going to continue to see high bills, going to continue to see that inflationary pressure. Um, we did have some protests over the weekend in some Nordic countries, uh, specifically in Prague, not Nordic countries. We had protests in Prague over demand to have the state support them when it comes to energy bills. What is the likelihood that over the energy crisis, over inflation, that we're going to see more political discontent sweeping Europe? it will be likely to see more growing uh, social unrest, uh, even because we are moving uh, towards the winter. And so uh, we depend also how the winter will uh, will be. If we are facing a harsh uh, winter, this will be uh, really difficult for uh, consumers and households. Uh, and so uh, in several countries, we, we could see the emerge of populism and nationalism that will try to prevent and protect their national interests uh, at the expense of the EU integration. Does that mean that, Pierre, we're about to see a rupture in what has been a pretty remarkable EU unity following a Russia invasion of Ukraine? So far, we have um, seen uh, a remarkable unity in the EU. Now it's uh, time for the governments to implement all the plans, uh, for example, uh, regarding gas storage, uh, we see some development, positive developments, uh, but also for uh, demand reduction. Uh, we need to see governments uh, uh, coming closer and together to face uh, the current crisis in order to prevent uh, disruptions and competition among consumers and uh, states. Jack, uh, sorry, not Jack, uh, Pierre, we were just talking to Jack, of course, about some of the issues in, in metal markets and in other markets uh, as well. I mean, this is, this is a problem that's being faced across industry, um, across continents. What is the likelihood that we're going to see more companies falter? We're going to see more defaults as, you know, perhaps consumers are unable to pay. And it means that they're unable to pay, that they have to draw down some of their cash reserves. Are you worried about industry-wide defaults? as an effect of what we're currently seeing in these energy prices? Yes, energy intensive uh, companies, uh, industry, we, we could see uh, more and more companies uh, default. And so uh, now it's time for governments to find uh, the balance uh, to uh, ensure the funds to the most vulnerable groups uh, in the society both consumers, uh, private consumers, but also the private sector. And uh, the, the critical issue is here is to avoid the uh, uh, universal sub uh, subsidies because so far uh, governments have allocated massive amount of public money, but in a universal way, this is exacerbate the issue, the, uh, the tight market and so on. And, uh, and so we, uh, it will be critical to governments to uh, protect uh, uh, the most vulnerable groups uh, and while leaving the price uh, for the rest, mm. and that will adjust uh, the market. Okay, Pierre, thanks for your time today. Pierre Paolo Ramondi, former Veneto Banca board member and current researcher at IAI. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to be speaking to Samuel Toombs, Pantheon Macroeconomics Chief UK Economist, on what the future of the UK looks like with Liz Truss at the helm. This is Bloomberg.
Europe continues to deal with the fallout of, Germ uh, of Germany no longer getting gas flowing through the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, Russia cutting off flows indefinitely. We are looking at nat gas futures off of the highs, but we are also getting some breaking lines of a draft document that set out check plans for their EU energy meeting on Friday. So from what Bloomberg has seen from this draft, let me walk you through these lines. They may call for a coordinated power cut and emergency liquidity instruments. They also may propose assessment of carbon ETFs. So again, this is a draft document seen by Bloomberg for the energy, energy meeting ministers. Uh, this could be what's helping to put nat gas off some of its highs. Of course, how will this be implemented? Where does the debt sit? All of that concern resulting in a euro that stays below parity versus the dollar trading at 99 cents at one point was trading at 98 cents. UK assets, they are stable this morning. Little changed after Liz Truss announced as the new PM. Speaking of which, coming up, we're going to be speaking to Lord Bill Moria, president of the Confederation of British Industry. This is Bloomberg.